All right. On, the, on February the 14th uh, this year, the Academic Staff Union of Universities embarked on a nationwide strike to press over about eight demands from the federal government to make lives easier for academic staff across the country. Some of its demands include funding or for the revitalization of public universities and um, academic allowance for funding of state universities and promotion areas. After several attempts at resolving this issue, they decided to go on an indefinite strike, saying the government must yield to all their demands. Finally, a headway has been made following a meeting with the executive members of the union where they decided to suspend the strike after eight months. Joining us via Zoom from Abuja is public affairs analyst and the program director, Datafight, Datafight rather, Adenike Aloba. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on TVC Breakfast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Now, let's get your impressions of uh, ASU's decision to suspend this strike. Um, I, th I think it's about time because I think whatever they were holding out for, obviously in the, it did not come through in the first eight months of the year. It had become clear to everyone that everybody had to shift grounds a little bit. We don't yet have the full details of the negotiations that led to the suspension of this strike, but I think everyone can agree that it's about time for the strike to be called off. Eight months is a long time for students to be sitting at home and for our institutions to be locked up. So yes, I was. Um, I, when we have the details, we'll know what was agreed and what was argued back and forth. But I think it makes sense and it's about time for the strike to be called. Well, I was um, earlier in the program quoting um, a, a line from a poem, a ballad. Uh, it was a, the ballad of Sir Andrew, which said, I'm struck, uh, I'm struck and wounded. I lay me down and rest a while, but I rise and fight again. Now, it does this sound like that, that they have just been beaten and they've struck <laughs> and they are wounded and they are waiting to nurse their wounds so that they will fight again? Honestly, again, I, I, I may not describe it exactly like that because we do not know what was agreed yet in that room. The federal government has promised a circular, ASO has promised a press release, we're waiting for that. But even if that is the position, let's assume, oh yeah, you know, we fought this long and now we, you know, there's a Yoruba saying that says he will live to fight another day, really. And this may well be the case of he will live to fight another day. Um, are they wounded and having to re-strategize? Perhaps not wounded, but one thing is clear. There's a need to re-strategize. There's a need to rethink. Are these strike actions effective? Uh, to what extent are they effective? Are we getting the answers that we need to get? So maybe they're not mortally wounded and, you know, bleeding. But the one thing that is, you know, clear is there is a rethinking and a rising again to fight another day. Interesting. And uh, we are hoping to see uh, how that will pan out at the end of the day in terms of uh, fighting to ensure the revitalization of uh, universities because this is one aspect that they have been speaking about. But let's look at what has happened leading up to the call for the suspension of this strike. The government's intervention thus far, we had seen the Minister of Labor coming to you know, intervene one way or the other, and later we saw the Minister of Education also coming to have a conversation with these persons. And we eventually saw the leadership of the House of Representatives led by the Speaker, Femi Bajabi Amila, which led to what we are seeing somewhat now. I wonder what you make of how the government handled this matter through the eight months. So, uh, to be honest, I think that there might have been, or at least the way it is interpreted to those of us who are watching from the outside, it almost felt like the federal government was not quite as bothered about the fact that the schools were shut. And that position uh, might well be established by the fact that several agreements have been signed and there have been several defaults. 
which again questions the sincerity of the government when it comes to sign these deals and the sincerity of the government when he says, oh, suspend the strike, we're going to take these actions. It does make one wonder, do we really care about the education, uh, the educational sector? Do we really care about the children who are impacted by this problem? What, I mean, it was difficult to find one singular thread of what government was thinking. It was difficult to find oh, this is where the government's head is. It was difficult to find a quote, um, a, a press statement that detailed government's positions, what they were or they were not, uh, what they were or they were not doing around uh, the ASU strike or around the demands of ASU. So it, it does feel a little bit like the government was passive. The reasons for their passivity, uh, passivity may differ, people may, I mean, there have been conversations that look, However, we think about it, it's not sustainable for government to continue to fund education. Uh, however, we think about it, we're going to have to rethink revitalization of our educational sector. But the challenge was that there was no clear communication from the government of what their position is, not just saying, oh, we're negotiating or we're talking to them, they don't want to talk back at us, but actually letting us know where your head is, what are you thinking, what are you proposing, what are the counter arguments that you're making. It was difficult to find, you know, that thing that you could say, oh, yeah, this is the government's position, which would make you feel then that perhaps the government was uh, passive, almost tilting towards apathy throughout this eight-month period. It is, uh, it is hard to uh, accept everything you just said because the government announced that uh, as far as salary was concerned, uh, which was also a critical part of the um, negotiations, that they, they gave a particular salary that they wanted the ASU professors to earn and what lecturers should earn. They gave, uh, they gave, they gave that point. And uh, they said that there was the Briggs Commission uh, that was uh, agreed to by a previous government in 2009. And they said that they didn't have uh, enough, uh, enough money to communicate, to communicate uh, that. And, uh, and even the minister himself said, he said, we have given them an offer, but they've not given us counter counter offer. So what we want, uh, want is counter offer. And ASU, ASU said there's no need for a counter offer because the offer came from a body that was uh, already appointed by government, not this government, but the previous government, so they are, then, 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 even the um, minister of uh, education said they had agreed on everything with the ASU, except as a backlog of salaries. And ASU came back and said we didn't agree on anything. So the, the thing is not the thing, the thing. actually is that neither government nor ASU was very clear about what was going on because. Because we don't even have the minutes of this discussion. Nobody, none of this side was actually very transparent in telling us the details of conversation. All we had is, had is we so, have not so agreed, here, we have agreed. In fact, yeah. you could say that the government was even more forthcoming about figures than ASU, ASU has been. Are you still there? Are you there? Alderi Kalob, are you there? So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is one body. Yes, ASU should communicate better. They should be clearer. Yes, I am. Can Go ahead. We can hear you now. Hello, can anybody hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I, I was saying that here is one thing. Yes, there were conversations about what was agreed, or we had agreed, we had not agreed. I think the point I was making was we were not, what, what are the government thoughts about the future of education? If you're insisting, look, we don't have the money to finance this thing, what is your plan? I mean, however we think about it, it's not as if there's some utopia world where the government says, oh yeah, we're stepping out of education, uh, universities figure it out yourself. That can happen outside the communication or outside the actions of government. But here is the thing. ASU is a body that we did not vote into power, if you can think of it that way. There is one body that owes us, that actually has the responsibility, the bigger responsibility of clear communication, of, uh, of attempting to address the needs or the questions or the bothers in the heart of the people. And that's the government. So if we are wearing, I mean, everyone agrees that both parties, their communication was poor. But if we're weighing whose actions has more impact, 
and who should have been more responsive, more open, more forthcoming with information with, look, this is what we're thinking. These are the strategies that we want to take to achieve it. Then really, we look to government. We can advise ASU on how to better communicate for its own agendas and for what it wants to do. But really, the government owes us clearer communication, at the very least, to bolster, to bolster uh, the confidence of students who are just sitting at home and not figuring things out. You know, sometimes we watch the news and we see NAMs, for instance, you know, uh, discussing these issues. But really, that the representation we see in the news in reports does not quite cover the devastation of this action on everyday Nigerians, on everyday students. So yes, some people were speaking, there were some noise on social media, but the government owed a responsibility to its people to be clear about its propositions, but not just about its propositions, to show us a pathway, to show us, look, this is what, if ASU is not going to come out and say, oh, this is what was discussed, these are the lines, and these are the full stops, and these are the commas, and these are the issues, uh, or the challenges we have with what the government is proposing, the government should be able to tell us that. ASU does not owe us that. We'll be glad that ASU communicates better. We'll be glad that ASU positions itself better, positions its communication better. But the person we hold accountable really is government. But uh, some would disagree with you on the fact that ASU does not owe us that because it was calling on parents and uh, students and everyone to support its fight um, to what is yeah. demanding of government. So if they are not speaking to us, how then do we support them? How then do we support their fight for these demands that they are making from government? I think it's really about the question of who has the greater burden of communication. Now, ASU is soliciting for us to support them. If they don't communicate clearly enough, what they lose out on is our support. But government has a responsibility to be clear in its communication to us. They're not, it's not a, oh, come join us situation. It's not a, oh, we want you to support us situation. It's that they owe a responsibility. If ASU had communicated better, perhaps they could have captured the imagination of a, you know, of more Nigerians and sustained their fight, or perhaps they could even have benefited from uh, uh, diversity and uh, diversity of opinions and ideas and strategies around what they could do. But here is the point. Who has the greater burden? Who has the greater responsibility of communication? I would say that is government. They should have communicated, Clara. And when I say communication here, I'm not just referring to the letters of what is agreed or what is uh, what was what was said in meetings and the point of disagreement. I think that this was a missed opportunity to give us a clearer vision of what the government is seeing or envisioning or the strategy they have for the future of education in Nigeria. It was a missed opportunity. They could have done better. They could have reinforced their agenda. The point is where that is missing, then you're leaving us to assume that the government has no strategy when it comes to revitalizing education in Nigeria. Well, in a sense, I agree with you that uh, the, 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 the government has not had any strategy for revitalizing education rather than just throw money there. And it says it has no money, and they told, uh, and they told the, um, the ASU people that the money you're asking for, we don't have. And the, the ASU people keep saying that you have the yeah. money. But it looks like the ASU people have uh, actually worn out in this argument because um, from the, the feelings we are getting about the agreement he had with... Uh, they had with uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, is that the budget for next year is going to really accommodate um, um, the sum of money that they have been crying for, which means that the problem with, with, uh, with the government has been that it has not, it has not really um, prioritized uh, the real um, yeah. uh, uh, the issue of funding, uh, funding education. Um, but it also, it's also yeah. speaks, it also speaks to the absence of communication, even between them. Well, well, if they knew that this was going to happen, if they knew that this was, this, this was possible, this kind of money was possible for next year, uh, but next year, election, uh, next year, probably, next year uh, budget, yeah. uh, couldn't they have communicated it and couldn't uh, also, also have spoken in the same kind of language with them? Uh, so I, I see that there's really an absence of communication. That's why I said that they had they were involved in some kind of um, 
Kafka, Kafka's dialogue rather than having a, a dialogue between yeah. um, um, a well-intentioned group and another well-intentioned group that both of them went on went to the table with with, with like uh, like cats and dogs and they were they were they, they were soured into 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 the words and they soured out of out of the meetings that it was not a conversation yes. but it was a it was a dialogue between rival rival uh, housewives so, so, I mean, I do not disagree with you uh, in saying that these things could have been resolved, you know, quicker. If you are simply going to increase, you know, budget provisions for education, just say that at the very beginning and then we might as well all just go back home and wouldn't have eight months of students sitting at home. But here's the thing about development issues. They're always interconnected. Now, government is promising to increase allocation to education, but there's a bigger issue that Nigeria's budget is funded by debt. So essentially what government is promising in the real sense of the word is, well, we'll figure out a way to uh, allocate more of the borrowed funds to education. On the surface, you know, as a stopgap to end this strike action, yes, that's a good decision. There's a recommendation of a percentage that should be going to education uh, from a country's budget. But here's the thing, is that action sustainable? Right now, Nigeria is at 5.1% debt to GDP, which is higher than the threshold of 3%. So is that a sustainable solution? Which then means that if it's not a sustainable solution and Nigeria doesn't figure out a way to plug its revenue, the gaping revenue holes that we have and stop itself from borrowing and borrowing and borrowing to fund its government, then the reality is we might be here again in 2023 having the same argument with the government saying, oh, we don't have the money. And I'm saying, yes, you have the money. Because essentially, there's a bigger problem of revenue. The development problems are always interconnected. They're always, and that's the thing. If we solve one small one, we have to figure out the ripple effect, the domino effect on the several other issues that are connected. Now that the federal government is promising, oh, we'll increase allocation uh, to education, there is no corresponding a communication on improving the government's revenue to accommodate this promise that they have made. So what happens when in by 2023, middle of 2023, uh, it becomes unsustainable? Nigeria's debt has been rising to alarming levels. <laughs> I think that's the way to describe it already. So what happens when the funds are not available to fulfill this promise that they have made? Because really, there is a clear revenue challenge, which is why I think that, yes, yeah, Yes, we agree totally that we needed something, some way, some shift on both sides to end you know, this strike, but we need a long view. We need a strategy because obviously government simply sub, you know, pouring money into the educational sector is not sustainable. There, there has to be some other way, some other strategy. All right. Admittedly, it's not that government will completely remove its hand, but it is that there has to be a more sustainable way of revitalizing our educational sector. What you are saying, in, in essence, essentially, is that the strike is not going to be a strike of ASU for ASU, but it's going to be a, a strike against bad governors, against debt that is not that is not there. In other words, the strike, the the, the, the the grievances of the strike are going to confirm what the government is saying that they have no money. So you are striking not, not for education, you are striking against bad governance, which means that ASU is carrying a burden that is not supposed to carry in a strike. Hello? Should be shared a lot more broader, that a conversation that should be had from different perspectives and from different angles. As is always the case when you have a describe as finding its feet of a 62, uh, 60 plus year old man struggling to find its feet, but that's where Nigeria is. And so the problems are not just ASU problems. Now we're thinking, how do we make sure that government is not, you know, just blowing our money uh, all right. I don't know if you can hear me, Abiola Aloba. It seems there seems to be a challenge with the connection, uh, but there's so much 
to still talk about with regards to this matter because even the president, I think while he was presenting the budget at, uh, before the Senate said that um, the government cannot fund education alone. And I wanted to get her perspective because yeah. she was talking about what other aspect, uh, there has to be some other ways to address mm. this matter of revitalization. I hear you are back online. Abiola Aloba, can you hear me? Hi. Right. Yes, now, hi. Now, uh, quickly, the, the president was speaking about the fact that the federal government cannot handle uh, the aspect of financing education alone, because you've been talking about looking at other ways of addressing this matter. And I'm wondering what ways you think we can look at funding the education that can eventually lead to the revitalization of our educational system. Yes. So uh, you're correct, and I agree with the president that, you know, they can, it's not sustainable for them to fund education the way we have done it. Across the world, in most developed countries of the world, there's a mixed model. Uh, there's a mixed model uh, that includes, you know, loans, uh, uh, 